Thank you, Professor Bross, and thank you, Professor Dearborn, Lynn, for that generous introduction. It is uh, it's great to be here and to see the auditorium uh, full as it is. So thank you also to the students and the professors who uh, sacrificed a little bit from their studio time to, to be here and, and share in this, in this moment. It is a distinct pleasure to inaugurate this ex exciting spring semester lecture series. And congratulations to all of you who've been working hard to, uh, to make it happen. Um, I am thrilled to be the new director of the Illinois School of Architecture and honored to share with our academic community these short stories without an ending, which are ostensibly a few ideas about architectural education from the perspective of a practitioner. Therefore, I will inevitably extend any disciplinary reflections into the realm of practice and the search within my own experience of a unifying paradigm between theory and practice. It is not the only duality that I will address as director of the, of the school. In this academic institution, as in most, we offer degrees that revolve strictly around the arts and others around the sciences. But as architects within this millenarian tradition called the university or the, the universe of knowledge, where the name comes from, I believe we are privileged to engage a discipline that is as much about one, the arts and the humanities, as it is about the other, technology and the sciences. Or as the name architecture, we see it ar or arcos and techne, forming architecture. Granted, in some places, the pendulum may swing more to one side than the other. Uh, sometimes it may be inclined to the humanities and in others, such as our own experience, it may gravitate to a more technological pursuit. Nevertheless, architecture as a unique and remarkable discipline inhabits a special place that is rather eloquent in sometimes contradictory worlds. So let's ponder for a moment at the language we employ to describe this process. For example, in our own website. At the Illinois School of Architecture, we continue to build on our significant history. We believe that great architectural expressions grow from the marriage of technical knowledge and aesthetic considerations in a time where new formalism represents the avant-garde. We, like Nathan Ricker, look beyond current fashion, striving to leverage technological or technical virtuosity in the service of performative design, aesthetic expression, and service to society. John Haydock, the legendary dean at Cooper Union, defined his idea of architectural education in this quote. I don't think there are many things more important than being a teacher and being a student. That, to me, is the deepest social contract, the deepest social contract, to understand the idea that individual creativity within a willing community is a profound social act. The privilege of being teachers and students within the re this remarkable place, to be teachers in a place of spirit and to be spirited students, all one can do is to celebrate one's own discipline, as we do. That is an incredibly beautiful statement that transcends the mere doing and transgresses into the realm of the being. So architecture not just as, as an act of making, an act of doing, but also one that is about being. Because of the fact that I originally arrived in academia as a practicing architect teaching design, I gravitated to inquire and acquaint myself on the origins of the university, or how architecture became part of the university curriculum. Plato and the Academy, Aristotle and the Lyceum, Cassidorius, the Roman senator, and the liberal arts curriculum of the Trivium and the Quadrivium, in a monastery in his hometown of Vivarium, the predecessor of the monastic schools that eventually evolved into the first universities in Bologna, Paris, and Salamanca, where the term university was used for the first time. A thousand years later, we are still speculating about our place within this complex, and yes, sometimes contradictory, interlocking scaffolding of degrees, credits, requirements, and accreditations that sometimes we take for granted, or we think that it's always been like that. Our schools 
have been the epicenters of innovation and change. And yet, innovation in this day and age occurs faster than our own institutional ability to digest it in our academic circles, which are mostly well-meaning, but sometimes slow and bureaucratic. Change, on the other hand, let's talk about change. You know that, that, that uh, meme where the speaker asks the crowd if they want, who wants change? You know that one? And everybody raises their hand. And I'm sure that if I ask you, who wants change? Who wants change? Show of hands. Who wants change? And this, this is the funny part. Who's willing to change? Not even half of the <laughs> We'll get to that. Change is no longer taking place because, but in spite of our best intentions. So we need to sit down in, a, in, in an academic community and have a thoughtful conversation, begin a thoughtful conversation about our continued relevance as a discipline and about the shared and diverse platforms that you, our students, will inherit from our generation. Hopefully, falling in love with the process the same way we did sometime during the last few years of the previous century, at least in my case. It's hard to talk about things in the previous century, but pretty much. I will share today with you a few of my own stories about this love affair with architecture. They will touch upon academia, a practice through a variety of scales, drawing and representation, and finally I will dedicate some time to talk about places and their influence in, in my own work. Guaynabo, where I grew up, San Juan, where I have spent the last 20 years, Barcelona, because this semester we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of an international program, and finally China, which seems to embody the possibilities of the 21st century. I believe academia is not just the place where we develop uh, knowledge, but also has a responsibility to disseminate that knowledge beyond its, its walls of the building where we're at, the, the, the borders of our campus, and even in a world that's more connected than ever internationally as well. And it's one of the things that, that uh, as, a, as a previous administrator at, at the UPR, I put most of my emphasis on. And, and we created an in-house uh, UPR architecture uh, press, and we published over 30 books and journals in, in that time. Several of them that won awards not just uh, locally, but also internationally and served as, as platforms for our students and our faculty to show their work and their, and their research. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I, I organized a series of, of international symposia to talk about education, to talk about architectural education in places where it had been uh, developed um, or uh, or places that became emblematic in a particular moment. Uh, and we talked uh, about John Haydock and the Cooper Union and his publication and exhibition of, of Education of an Architect 40 years later. Uh, the evolution, evolution of pedagogy, architecture at Cornell and the days when, when Colin Rowe and, and Ungers were teaching there. All of that uh, became later part of a, of a book called uh, Chronologies of an Architectural Pedagogy and you see there the beginning or the, or the end of a, of a timeline that, uh, that was several pages long and, and it, it uh, intended to put in the same page discovery, innovation in, in sciences, in architecture, in universities to begin to, uh, to talk about overlaps between them. Uh, and it was a very interesting work and, I'm, uh, and we were looking backwards into how architecture became part of the university curriculum, how it, it's become what, what I was saying that we seem to take for granted uh, today, but also as, as the seeds for, for another larger investigation where we turn around and we look at the future of architectural pedagogy and our role in shaping that future, which hopefully uh, we'll have a, a symposium here at the University of Illinois, we'll begin that conversation next semester. Uh, 
part of, part of the process uh, was to talk to people that I, that I thought were, uh, were important academics, and, and one of them, certainly Peter Eisenman, to talk about uh, the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in, in the 60s and how that shaped uh, a way of thinking and a, and a way of doing that was Assemblage uh, magazine. And, and, I, and I think it, it's important that we have those conversations and, and hopefully those will evolve into a series of lunchtime conversations here in the atrium where we're gonna be discussing these uh, subjects with the students and, and with the faculty. Uh, I also started a series of uh, think tanks and uh, research labs where most of the architectural thesis were, uh, were then carried through. This one uh, about the virtues of urban life through that, about the city. And, uh, and certainly put a lot of emphasis on, on, on the making of, the making of things, not just drawing things, but, but creating prototypes to drawing and, and uh, and working in a place that, that had a very limited budget, creating uh, and facilitating the necessary tools for that exploration. And I guess we'll be talking about that later in, in this semester. And, and getting the students not just to work within the school, but, but also taking uh, over the city and, and making it the site of their work as well, here in the, in the courtyard of a museum. Yeah, I know you're familiar with, uh, with the solar decathlon competitions and we were able to participate on four, four of those in consecutive uh, uh, years, or at least in consecutive uh, uh, competitions. Uh, this is one of the houses that, that we built. It was really difficult because it had to be built, then uh, put on a shipping container, taken to Jacksonville or Norfolk, and then again taken to the mall in, in DC. And this is another one we did with, uh, with reclaimed wood. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, process and, and experience for, for faculty and, and for students. And I know those who were involved, it, it became, uh, became really important and formative in, in their careers. Uh, we got to a point where we were noticed uh, by Design Intelligence in, in, their, in their publications and, and, and their rankings. And that opened another series of, of possibilities to, uh, for ACSA to come into San Juan and do their administrators conference and, and bring that conversation into a larger uh, group, which then, uh, and I didn't know this was gonna happen, but then I, I, I got nominated to be the president of ACSA and I had a fantastic time in those three years leading uh, the, the association and now next year Lynn uh, will be taking over and. and will be privileged to, to have her as the ACSA president. Uh, I wanna show you a, a, a few projects. Uh, I'm not gonna stop too much in, in, in any of them, just to show you that I, that I, that I draw, that I design, that I, that I build, that I enjoy doing it. Um, and at different moments throughout my career, most, most of them uh, done in the last 15, 20 years, a lot of them residential explorations. And, and you will see uh, uh, predominantly uh, reinforced concrete or CMU with stucco. So when I said that I, that I come to, to academia and to the school as a, as a practitioner, I, I, I am a licensed architect with an office and, and, and work and I'll show you projects that, that are currently under construction at the end of this One is in Canada, San Juan. This is one that I, that I recently uh, finished with some interior work in a kitchen. And one project that is currently under construction, hopefully in the next couple of months, it will be, might be able in the next lecture to show you finished uh, photos of, of, of this house. I've always enjoyed doing competitions and the, and the studios that I taught at, at UPR, even when I was, when I was dean, I always taught a uh, design studio, was a, was a competition studio, working on three or four, and sometimes even five competitions per semester. And uh, 
And this is one of the first uh, competitions that I worked on, the Shinken Shiku Japan Architect Competition. This case was 1993, the Museum for the 20th Century. It's funny now in the 21st century to look back in those days and see what we were talking. This one was for a memorial for the third millennium that unified you know, the city as, as monuments, the, the triumphant arch, the obelisk, the fountain, and in this case, they, they were joined together to form one large monument that changed depending from uh, which perspective you were approaching the, the piece. These were drawings and, and renders for the Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo. For the Ground Zero project after 9-11. This was a, a prototype for a, a building in, in Puerto Rico with the hurricane. Uh, we are prone to hurricane uh, seasons and uh, we've had some uh, some difficult recent ones. And this was a building that, that incorporated uh, hurricane proof paneling as part of the, of the facade. So not just as something that then is applied over a building that, that you design and, the, and they're open uh, from within. So, so you could get a, a different kind of facade every day depending on, on how you open them and who opens them at a particular moment. This was a competition in, in Taiwan uh, for, a, for an institute uh, uh, of scientific research, Center for Disease Control. Um, monument in Dubai, it's a competition as well, and this one was a finalist uh, for a competition in, in, uh, in Brooklyn for a park. <coughs> this one was, uh, and, and I wanted to show some of the, the, to the students, some of the, the models and the sketches and the drawings and the process that, that we use uh, to, uh, to sort of work through a, a competition or, or a project. This one was for the Society of Architects that was doing a, an extension, an annex to its, to its building. And, and that passion for architectural competitions led to what I told you about uh, creating a studio that was just about competitions. And, and that was the, the conference room in, in the, in the Dinchi area. And the class would take place there. And the students would come in and, and we would work together. Uh, only one of the competitions in the semester you could work on your own. The, the other ones, it had to be in teams. So there was, a, there was a, uh, an emphasis on, on collaboration, as it will be once you, once you start practicing. And another one of the, of the requirements of the studio is that you had to present two competitions on different stages of development at the same time, as you probably will have to do in an office eventually. The work uh, of the students uh, has been exhibited uh, several times. Uh, almost every semester they win one or two awards. And, and it's a, you do it in fourth year in the first semester, so it's a, it's a portfolio builder for those who are applying to, to graduate programs abroad. So with a, with a big emphasis on, on teamwork and, in, and on conceptual uh, clarity and, and taking that conceptual quality throughout and, and then with presentation uh, techniques and strategies depending on, on the kinds of, of competitions. This was an ACSA competition for a, for a terminal in, in Dallas Fort Worth where we won two of, the, two of the awards. And this was a real competition uh, right after Hurricane Maria uh, organized by the, by the Society of Architects and the Society of Engineers, which was uh, meant for licensed practitioners. And I asked, I inquired whether I could use my license for the students to participate in, and they said that I could, and, and they ended up winning the second place. Originally, only the first place was going to be built, but then they found the, the funds to, uh, to build three, so the students are currently working on the construction documents for this house uh, to be built. And this was last semester, we were working on a competition for a school in, in, in Africa, for two of, the, two of the projects, this one and this one, which is interesting. 
And, and that has led me on, on, on my own uh, pursuit of, of understanding drawing and representation uh, as a way to, uh, to describe my own work. So hopefully I can do it in a way that, and, and as I tell the students, uh, the less you, you have to describe verbally your project, the more it reads clear, you know, clearly in terms of the presentation, the better off you are. The, most you have, the more you have to stand in front of it and, and, and verbally describe it, then it needs the, the presentation that, that, that is in need. And so a few of the methods that I will use for, for my own presentations. Talking about, for example, here before and after, what's existing and what's proposed in order to make the, and models. We like to work in models and I wanna see models in the studios. I'm gonna walk around and I'd like to see students uh, working on them, whether it's on the wood shop, whether it's on your own, whether it's you know, uh, digital fabrication. And the fact that we have all these tools for renderings, for digital fabrication, doesn't mean that we have to divorce ourselves from the, the beautiful methods of, of hand drawing. And I really enjoy uh, to draw, to draw. Uh, and 90% and, and of the time I spend in my office, it's probably freehand drawing and, and, and working on freehand on my, on my plans, on sections, on elevations, on digesting the, the city, for example, here marking walk around public spaces, drawing in a little paper in the, in the hotel, when we travel, always carrying a sketchbook here, is a, so I'm trying to find a few solutions for that last house that I showed that was under construction. And even here in an ACSA conference using the <laughs> the little booklet just to sketch a, a few ideas for, for a project. And, and sketching allows you to do many other things. Here is, is an example of uh, uh, the development of the mascot logo for the University of Puerto Rico, which is the roosters. And, and believe me, it's very hard to make a rooster look good or look fierce or look <laughs> competitive. And the one we had previously was, was horrible. You know, it looked like it was dancing or I don't know. And, and in, in one uh, uh, academic senate meeting, and, and we were seated by, by alphabetical order, so I was Rodriguez, so I was way in the back, and I was dozing off, and I started thinking about the, the possibilities of, of changing that, that law when we started doing these, these sketches, and, uh, and then presenting them to the university, and, and we got them, we convinced them to, to change the, so, Drawing on a little napkin when you're, when you're having coffee or when you're you know, in a restaurant or anywhere can produce something that, that is actually going to become you know, something important. And that became then the official branding for the, for the university and even won several awards at the International Biennale in, in, in Madrid for the branding campaign. So, so all of that starts with your hand, drawing, and, and I have another project which I'll show later, of designing a bench that also started by doing a little sketch in a, in a napkin and pushing it forward and seeing how, how far it can, it can go. So I'm gonna talk now about, about four places and, and the way that, that history and, 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 and the significance of place then sort of follows and, 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 and results in a particular design process. And I'm going to talk about San Juan, which as you know, it's a, the capital of an island of Puerto Rico in the, in the Caribbean. And it's a, it's a beautiful bay with, uh, with a gridded city. It was discovered in Columbus, by Columbus in 1493. So technically being part of the US, it is the oldest city in the, in the United States. Here you see the development of that grid around the bay in the beginning of, of the fortification process is a city that through history has been in contact with, uh, with the ocean and with, with ships coming and, and going. And a beautiful place to, to visit. I know that this semester we're gonna have 
architecture, planning, and landscape architecture uh, projects in, in San Juan with professors and students uh, going there and, and students from uh, Puerto Rico visiting, visiting Illinois. So this should be, this should be interesting. And this is the, the grid on the wall uh, from above with uh, here a, a drawing with all the courtyards, large and, and, and small, which is one of the, the beautiful uh, things uh, uh, about the city. This is a, an, actually a, an article I wrote about, about the courtyards in, in, in old San Juan, both in large scale, institutional, and even the, the small ones that, that uh, are quaint and, and, and uh, introverted. This is a, a painting by one of our first painters in, in Puerto Rico, Jose Campeche, uh, of a governor, a Spanish governor, and it's interesting because it portrays the governor almost like the architect of the, of the city. It has, shows in his left hand a, a plan of the city with, with the grid, and then a window that is, that is taken all the way to the ground behind him and, and looking at a perspective of the street with the workers uh, installing the, the, the famous cobblestones on the, on the street, and it's interesting that in the moment that he chooses to, right now we have, you know, we do selfies every minute. Back then, if you were getting a painting like that, it was, you know, your shot at, at, at being remembered. And, and he chooses to portray himself as that, as the architect, the urbanist, the creator of the city. And it is a beautiful place. This is Columbus Plaza, Cafe Berlin, and the apartment above Cafe Berlin where I had the privilege of of living for, for a couple of years. Uh, the photos of, of my kids at an earlier age enjoying the, the city. <coughs> so it's not really a museum city, it's a city that is, that is utilized. Cultural events, uh, on the right hand side are our students from the School of Architecture drawing in one of the, the streets. The left hand side is a, it's a cultural event uh, where there are carnivals, and, uh, and, and I'm gonna show briefly three, three interventions that have, of, of different scales that I've been able, to, which are very different it's when you're working on a, on a historic place, uh, because on the one hand, <coughs> there is respect for the, for the various layers that you encounter in a historic city like this, <coughs> but also you wanna leave a mark, right? And, it's, and you wanna leave a contemporary mark. Right? So these, uh, was an office for a, for a foundation, and uh, let me see. I think, that, yeah, that's the, that's the only image that, that I'll show. But it, but it, you can see there both memory and and, and desire. The, the leaving that wall uh, intact and taking the gypsum board close to almost touching the the older wall and, and separating it and, and putting a uh, light between the two so that the light when it's turned on it it bathes the the wall. Another <coughs> project that I worked on uh, after the, the, the hurricane. You can see working here with, with the courtyard, creating those, the, the shading pattern. This was uh, the Luna Cinema. Luna is moon in Spanish, and it's Calle Luna, so it's a moon street. There's a sun street, a moon street, and. And the Luna Cinema is one of the oldest, if not the oldest cinema in the, in the Caribbean. And a university purchased the, the building and wanted to renovate it and use the old cinema as their, as their uh, auditorium. So this is, this is how, we, how we found it in a precarious uh, state. You can see some images of how. Uh, but look at one of the interesting things and in, in, in why I show this image, look at the beams with uh, the, something that looks like graffiti, but what they were actually uh, advertising for the cinema. So it said stuff like, if your sons are doing well in school, please bring them to the cinema on Tuesday nights and it'll be cheaper, blah, blah, you know, stuff like that. And we convinced the owners to, to, main, to protect and maintain uh, those, those ads as, as part of the history of, that, of, of the place. You see some, some images of before and, and, and after. And working on, a, on, a, on the design of a, of a door for the entrance, once you, you respect uh, history, that also in a few places you have the opportunity to leave something different, to leave something you know, that, that speaks more eloquently about our 
particular moment in history. You see the sketch on, on the left and, and then the, the finalized door on the, on the right. Pierre and the, uh, working on it with a friend of mine who's both an architect and, and works with, with wood in his workshop. And then So it's a, it's a beautiful process of, of, of sketching something and then building it, not, not something that you will find in a store, but that you, that you actually have to sit down and see how it works and how, how you will be able to, to put it together. And also we did it for the, the entrance to the, to the auditorium, or what used to be the cinema. And seeing a photographer here using it for his collection of, of, of photos, so that was uh, interesting. The same university owns uh, this 1930s building that used to be a, a school, and you can see the damage on the right-hand side after Hurricane uh, Maria of, uh, of a series of classrooms that, that flexible classrooms that also uh, doubled as, as an auditorium space, and, and in very little time we had to, we had to work with, with that space and turn it into, so removing all of the, the that uh, acoustical paneling and, and learning that, that you know, it was a high ceiling actually, and then we could benefit from that, and, and so we turned that space into into this, and cr also creating a, a a special interior facade for the for the entrance. Also working with uh, with uh, my colleague who who has the wood show. Go then to, uh, to the place where I grew up, Guaynabo, which is sort of a, it's kind of a suburb outside of 10, 15 minutes from, from San Juan, a dormitory city to the, to the capital. But that it also has, and I, I call it between the Spanish grid and the American highway, because it's right here where there's a small grid of the, of the old colonial town, and, and then it has this, this crossing of, of two highways with two different kinds of urbanism. And we had to work in, in, in and I'll show you some, some historic buildings in that grid and, and see the two scales, the, the scale of the grid and, and above the scale of the highway with larger buildings like that theater. And, and we had to work to sort of create a hybrid condition between those two for a development. And, and you can see there that, that we were proposing buildings that were at the larger scale of the highway but also buildings that, that created small public plazas like a cafe uh, at the scale of the, of the town. One that, that became a strip building along Main Street for commercial activity. And then an anchor in the middle of the development which was then <coughs> used by the, the Spanish uh, TV network Univision also creating and proposing the public spaces and, and public art around the, the development, the master plan. And we were lucky that we were able to design some of those public spaces. There's a park. And for that park, we designed the benches that, I, that I'll talk a little later. This was a, a veterans memorial. And here it's celebrating with, with our students in, in one of those spaces right after it was uh, built and, uh, and, and, and the project won uh, an award in, in one of the biennials. Talk about Barcelona, not just because Sara is somewhere around here, I mean, because we have uh, the, hundred, I mean the 50th anniversary of our international program later this, this semester, but also because it, it is a place that that I'm passionate about and that I feel like, like home when I, when I go there. And, and I first started visiting Barcelona in 1990, around 1992 as it was getting ready for the, for the Olympics. And you see there one of the, the towers by, by Calatrava and the, that beautiful image of the diving with the towers of, the, of Gaudí, Sagrada Familia in the back. So it, it's incredible how sports and, and, and the city were, were, and the image of the city were united in a, in a way that was so special in, in those Olympic games. And, and coincidentally, the, the, the Van Allen 
William Van Allen International Competition that year was a proposal to do something with the Sagrada Familia. And, and there's my, my, one of my drawings next to the, the, the image of the diver uh, participating in the competition and, and, and getting the second place. I was, I was living in France that year. It was a study abroad and, and we were working on another competition for the school. And this one we were doing on, on the weekends, you know, because of the fact that we had just been to Barcelona and, the, and, and so we were working on, on two competitions at, at the same time and, and, and actually got lucky on, on, on both of them. Uh, historic image of, of the city next to the Mediterranean with Montjuic uh, to the left. You see the, the walled uh, city with the, the, you know, the, the medieval and Roman uh, streets. And you can see it here with the Mediterranean, but also with the, with the nearby uh, towns and how those were connected as the city expanded through the Fonsa de Das uh, in Sanche for enlargement, plan enlargement of, of the city. And you can see here the, uh, an aerial photograph nowadays of, of the, how the city looks. And you can see the older uh, part of the city next to the port and the gridded city with the, with the diagonal bringing in together those towns that were originally separate towns and are, are now part of the overall fabric of the, of the city. And an aerial photograph looking from the Ensanche, looking into the older part of the city and the connection at Plaza Catalunya of the Paseo de Gracia, connecting then to the Rambla all the way to the Columbus uh, Monument down by the, by the port. So you see the two sort of Barcelonas uh, there. Uh, and here is the, the Paseo de Gracia and one, one of the, the, the beautiful uh, avenues, wide avenue, looking uh, uh, and a great place to explore the section of the, of the street, various streets and, uh, throughout the city and, and the connection between the, between the trees, between the sidewalk, lighting, urban furniture. Uh, <clears throat> and this is just one of the sides of the, of the Paseo de Gracia. And then you look at the size of, you know, this 30, 40 feet, even before you get into the actual uh, street, the two rows of, of, of trees. And this is on the other side, not on the Ensanche, on the, the Rambla, you see the, the middle of the, what would be the middle of the road here is the space that is used for pedestrian and for public activity and relegating the cars to two smaller streets on, on either side. So he's saying that the, the important thing of the connection here is the pedestrian walking all the way from the port into the Plaza Catalunya. Obviously, we know from our history classes about, about Gaudí and, and his work, and they are the, the Casa Milá, La Pedrera, and, and, and that Paseo de, de, de Gracia, and, and even uh, he not only designed those, the Casa Bajo and the Casa Milá there, but also the pavement, the pavement for, the, for the Paseo de Gracia. <coughs> And you can see the other one here, the, the Casa Bajo in the Manzana de la Discordia. How do you translate that, Sara? The <laughs> Block of discord. <laughs> yeah. And here we have the, the, one of the courtyards of the Casa Milá with a beautiful uh, roof terrace. Uh, and, and, the, and then also the, the splendid <coughs> main door into the, into the Casa Mila. And also uh, urban moves that you get in the, in the older part of the city, the rationalization of space in the, in the Plaza uh, Real, of, in the tradition of the, of the Plaza Mayores that you would see in the, in the rest of the, of the peninsula. Uh, also a beautiful space to sit around its, its galleries or to enjoy the, the public space. In, in a mosse, in a, in a scale that is, compared to the other Plaza Mayores, I think it's a scale that is, that is much better for, for the human than some of the others that, that you see in, in, in other cities. And, uh, and this is looking from the office of, of one of the Spain's uh, and Barcelona's most important urbanists and architects, Oriol Boigas, who uh, I also uh, was able to, to sit with him and talk about this, uh, this project of the, of, of architectural pedagogy and where were we and where were we heading. So an incredible conversation there then, but in, a, in a beautiful space at the, at the Plaza Real. In the UIA, 
Congress, we're about to have one in, in Rio de Janeiro. The last one was in, in, in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and in 1996, it was in Barcelona, four years after the Olympics. And, and I was lucky to be there uh, with a Fulbright Fellowship that year and work on here on an exhibit of art and architecture in the Madrid of the 1950s. And, and I show it because it's, it's, it's part of my memories of, of the city, We're spending that summer there and working on this exhibition, but also because I, I was able to have in my hands that beautiful section by Alejandro de la Soda. You, many of you may not know or may not know this project, but it, it is an incredible, those of you who, here who mix architecture and, and, and structures, is the Maravillas Gymnasium in a, in, a, in a school. And look at the sketch and look at the actual drawing and there in the cover of, of AV and, and how they use the structure to create the classrooms above the court and look at the, the bleachers as, as well. You get the natural light and the court and the, and the bleachers and then the, the classrooms above, it's an incredible project and I, and I was lucky because I had seen that, that sketch before and, and, and I was able to, to exhibit the original one from, from Soda in, in that exhibition in, in, in Barcelona. That was also, I, I think, the beginning of the Star Architect uh, that day in front of the, in front of the Museum of, of Contemporary Art by Richard Meyer. There you had uh, Norman Foster and Peter Eisenman and Daniel Liebeskin and some other architects doing a debate and and Eisenman is very, very smart for these things, and so he got a, a shirt of the Barcelona football team, and he wore it for the debate, and he made the cover of the, of the newspapers the next morning wearing the, the Barca shirt. Um, but it, 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 it was an event that, it, that was almost like, like attending a, a famous person concert. It, it, it was incredible how, how things turned in, in that moment in our, in our own architectural culture. There were a series of competitions uh, at the UIA 96. I decided to do one, which also had to do with the, with the Barcelona football team, soccer team, which was proposing what to do with, with the, the block where it, where it stands. And, and, and this was our proposal, which was one of the finalists, and, and, and it was exhibited there in, as part of the, the events. And, and then all those experiences we brought brought them home to, uh, to the university in, in, in Puerto Rico and created a, a, a series of symposia uh, between the, the law school and the architecture school dealing with, uh, with the legal and the design aspects of urbanism and public space in San Juan and, and in Barcelona. And later on, I returned to, to the city to work with this company, Escofed, which is the, the, the company that, that did the, the Gaudí pavers and, and is still working, and, and, and a lot of the, the most famous architects out there uh, are doing uh, benches and urban furniture with them, and uh, they're work, still working on the, on the pieces, on the precast pieces to finish the, the Sagrada Familia. And, and I was lucky enough to, that one of those napkin uh, sketches the, that I did about this bench, they were interested in, the, in, in developing it, and, and then I, I worked there with a, with a group and, and ended doing this, this piece, this, this model that's probably even nicer than the actual bench is a piece of, of art. And then that was the first bench that came out of the production. And now I can, you can see it. This is in Doha, in Qatar, in a, in a park, or in Puerto Rico, in the, in the School of Architecture. Or every once in a while, I'll, I'll see it in, a, in social media and somebody writing about it. So uh, again, like, like, the, like, like the, the, the rooster design that started with a, with a napkin sketch, this one also started like that. And, and you never know what, what, how, how you're going to end with, uh, you know, it could, it could actually become something. And then finally, I'll talk, uh, uh, talk about my experience in, in China in a project with Ai Weiwei the same year of, of the Olympics, <coughs> the Ordos uh, 100. This was uh, an exhibition that we did later in Art Basel. And this was a group of 100 architects from all over the world uh, gathering there in Ordos in Inner Mongolia. In, in, in a time where, where there were several things happening in, in, in China, there was the anniversary, there was the Olympics, the, 
the expo in, in Shanghai, some protests, and, but cer certainly framed by the impressive uh, uh, display in the, in the Olympics and the, and the, the stadiums, uh, but also the, the reality of, of the, of the, contaminate, the, the smog and the, and the pollution uh, and, and the, the byproducts of, of extreme uh, production that, that we experience, is, and also with the replacing of the, of the traditional hutong, the courtyard housing. And uh, when, we, when I arrived there, and this is a, the first day, and I thought it was a cloudy day, or, but they told me that that was actually an average day, a normal day in, in Beijing. And, and, and it, as an architect, you're impressed by the, by the airport. And, and that was only 10 years ago, and now they're gonna be inaugurating a, a new Zaha Hadid airport. That was a Norman Foster airport. Now they're inaugurating an O, and this was a, the, the walkway to the parking area. And then finding, around the city looking for, for Rem Koolhaas' uh, CCTV uh, building and but, you know, in, with, in this context of, of, the, of the gray sky was very difficult. So, so getting used to this image and then going there to photograph what, what was there, well, you know, there, there was this dichotomy between what, what was shown to the world and, and the actual photographs as, as you would experiment them and, and then you know, where we were working, which was really in, in the middle of nowhere, uh, and, you know, working for this guy who was a developer, uh, who, you know, smoked Cuban cigars and wore, you know, designer shoes and Armani suits, and, you know, and there you have a like hundred architects dressed in black, roaming the desert looking for their site, The, the big model in the in the hotel conference room where everybody then placed their their, their own uh, proposal and and there was actually a, a like a lottery for the for the sites and and that was the one we we uh, we were assigned which was interesting because uh, um, at least there were there were there were a few things about about the site that made it unique and special certainly that it was at, at the end of, of, of an axis that it was a little longer than, than other sites. That square, which was a proposed footprint of, of the house, is uh, the same dimensions of the, of the Villa Savoie, Le Corbusier. So it was at the end of this, of this road. And, and this was a suggested, the, the proposed site with a suggested footprint. And we decided to make a, a few changes. No turn it with the, with the prevalent geometry of the, of the site, change the, the footprint to one that was longer and occupied the site in a better way. And, and then there was, there was a division of the program in, in, in two, so we, we separated the program in two and wanted the, the view, of the perspective to go actually through the house. And since there was a requirement of a basement, then we sunk part of the house and then we had a bar that was floating over it. But that wasn't enough because the two main spaces of it, it had to have a courtyard and the two main spaces of the house had to face the same direction and they weren't here. So we did a little squiggly thing, like un churro, and we did it in a nicer way, right? We were beginning to experiment with, with programs uh, 10 years ago uh, and, uh, and to work on a structural model uh, with a frame that could actually be turned uh, you know, a few degrees in each iteration in order to create the, the movement in the, and, and the courtyard in the, in the building. And there you see the courtyard going all the way down to the, to the basement and to a pool that was required in the, in the program as well. It was one of the few houses that actually had a port cocher that you could actually drive around and then drive down to a garage in the, in the basement. There you see the, the courtyard going all the way down and the, the basement with the lap pool bringing together the various spaces with uh, these skylights that also became gardens so that you didn't feel like the basement was, was an actual basement. <coughs> also the windows had to face the same direction as the, as the, the two main uh, parts of the building so we, we created this uh, this diagonal uh, fins 
bring light from that, that area. And, uh, and it, it was a wonderful experience. And they were exhibited at the Architecture League in, in New York there with, uh, with my team and with Ai Weiwei. And uh, beautiful experience that, that, that I got to go twice that year to, to China. I haven't been back since, since then, and I look forward to, uh, to retaining, to returning and, 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 and finding avenues of, of, of collaboration between our, our institutions. Um, I will, as another part of the stories, I, I created a, a, a postscript, a little bit about the, the, the beauty and the history of, of this place, and I'll say a couple of things that, that I mentioned in my, in my <coughs> welcoming letter to the, to the semester, and, and I'll try to finish with that. Uh, in 1865, as the Civil War was coming to an end, William Ware, first heard head of the School of Architecture at MIT, the only one that rivals Illinois for the recognition of first School of Architecture in the U.S., said, it is the aim of this school to do what it can in its day and generation to ensure that the architecture of the future shall be worthy of the future. Shortly after that, the same year Frank Lloyd Wright was born, Illinois became the first public, of public school of architecture in the United States. In 1873, as Daniel Burnham opened an office with John W. Root and Louis Sullivan moved to a city of Chicago still recovering from the Great Fire, Illinois was the first university to graduate an architect, Nathan Ricker. Six years later, Maria Louisa Page became the first woman to graduate with an architecture degree in North America. And in 1904, while Frank Lloyd Wright was designing the Unity Temple in Oak Park, Walter T. Bailey was the first African-American from Illinois to graduate in architecture. Illinois celebrated its 50th anniversary as World War I came to an end, the Bauhaus was founded in Germany, and Charles Platt began to work on the University of Illinois campus. Platt and the Bauhaus at the, the same time. Its 60th anniversary as Siam was founded in Europe, Mies designed the Barcelona Pavilion, and Le Corbusier built the Villa Savoie. It's 70th, as Frank Lloyd Wright designed Falling Water, and Mies came to Chicago to take over IIT. It's 80th anniversary, as Mies designed Farnsworth House. It's 90th, as Crown Hall was finished and CM was disbanded. And finally, it's century celebration, as Aldo Rossi and Robert Venturi published Architecture of the City and Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, respectively giving birth to postmodernism in architecture. And now, a little over 150 years later, we sit in this Plym Auditorium as an integral part of that tradition, looking back to honor those who came before us, but turning around to ensure that an architecture of the future will always be worthy of the future. Thank you very much.